Hi, and welcome to Creative Quarantine. It is, what day is it again? Is it a win, one, Mun Wednesday? Send Thursday. Um, seriously, I, I am so excited. We're here with one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Sparkle Glitter Princess, Julie Nathanson. Hey, honey. <laughs> Hello. It's oh. nice to see your face. Oh, it's so nice to see your I haven't seen your face in so long. I and know. here we are. <laughs> I know. And our, our first meeting was at, was at E3 in the middle of the chaos up on the Marvel stage. <sighs> It was, it was such a good great. day. It was such it was a, a great day. day. We we bonded over um, sparkles and levity, and here we are, meeting sparkles and levity. Yeah, and that's what we're gonna give. We're gonna give sparkles yep. and levity a little realness, but then more sparkles and more levity. Uh, and I'm really excited you're here. You you are probably you're so talented, but I also just uh, your voice. <laughs> is so soothing in whatever, in whatever character in which you're playing, even when you're not playing someone who's not so nice. It's very weird. Um, but Thank for you. those who are tuning in, like you have had like a sense of like since 90210, but you are best known as like a voice. I didn't, and, and I know there's there's several different categor categorizations, right? There's mm -hmm. a voiceover actress, there's a voiceover mm -hmm. performer. Um, you have done work for animation, for games. Uh, I am sure you've done all sorts of commercial work, uh, but you know, folks across the board have kind of heard your voice and some of their favorite properties. <laughs> um, but what are you, what are you working on right now? Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a ridiculous thing. You know, we love to talk about the, th the things that we do and we're not really permitted to. So um, it's, it's, I'm always excited to share about something when it comes out. Um, so there are some big games that I'm excited about. Um, there's an animated series that I'm, I'm amazed by. Um, so there are some really great projects. And of course, I want to keep my job, so I will not be telling you about any of them. Uh <laughs> NDAs are both yeah. uh, restrictive and magical. Uh, yeah. And you, we should always honor those. Uh, but folks have have heard your voice from anywhere from Batman Beyond. Yeah. Um, you've you even like, and I'm pretty sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. You made a little bit of a sneak appearance in one of my favorite video games, which is Spider Man for PS4. Yes, that's um, right. That's which right. I was very like. There's always this moment when I, I know enough voice actors and perform mm -hmm. and performance actors at this point where I will stop in the middle of the game. I'll put it on pause and I'm like, <laughs> I am DB. Am I right? Um, I like when I get the text messages from friends. Did did you just kill me in that game? And I'm like, probably. I don't know. Hold on, let me check. Um, but yes, I, I I do make a little appearance in uh, in the Spider Man game. I've been really lucky. I've I've um, been working for a long time now, and uh, people keep seeming to hire me, and I get to keep playing, which is which is really magical for me. Um, I did start out in uh, mostly for animation in the, in the DC world doing um, a spinoff of Batman Beyond called The Zeta Project. Um, and I guest starred on a whole bunch of other series during that time. Um, and since then, I've done a ton of games. Um, I play Jess Black in Far Cry 5. I've done quite a few Final Fantasy games. Square Enix has been very good to me. Um, I played Prish in Decidia Duodecim. I am Chocolina in uh, <laughs> in uh, Final Fantasy 13 2 and Lightning Returns. Um, and I've done, well, any number of other games. Um, I've also done um, uh, Samantha Maxis in the Call of Duty games, um, and uh, Elena of Avalor, I play uh, Scarlett Turner, who is Naomi's mom, and let's see what else. I don't see you anymore, so I feel like I should keep talking. I can't really tell if you're still there, so I'm just going to talk for a while. What are you guys doing? Yeah, I'm going to check my text messages, because maybe you've texted me, and that there is a reason I can't see you anymore. I'm not checking. I don't see anything from you. Oop. Nope. Okay. So I think I'm going to text Angelique, see if I can find her, because I only see me and I can't hear her anymore. And uh, I don't really know how to riff on a live stream. So, so stand by. You're still watching, aren't you? This is going to be weird. 
and texting her. Where are you? <laughs> okay, here's what it says. My computer just freaked. Okay, she's on her way. This is very exciting. So um, I guess I should just continue to tell you my resume. That really feels semi-boring, but I'll try. Um, let's see, Marvel Avengers, I've played Crimson Widow. Uh, let's see, in my household, um, I play mom. Uh, I also, in my life, play daughter and voice actor. Um, <laughs> I wish I could actually communicate with you guys, but I think I think that stuff is on her end. Um, but this is my home. Welcome to my desk area. There's a desk, you can't see it, but that's where the laptop is. Um, this is a blank wall. I should probably put some stuff on the wall at some point, or I'm gonna start drawing on it. That'll be my creative quarantine. I'll just start drawing on the walls. <laughs> Let's see. Just in case uh, we have to keep chatting without our beautiful host, um, I will share with you that my experience being in this sort of lockdown, creative quarantine world is um, it's a roller coaster, isn't it? Right? It's an evolution. And I think for most of us, we're sort of amassing information and trying to make sense out of it and trying to integrate what we're learning into our lives. Um, and I, the phrase a new normal is, uh, there's something about it that doesn't always work for me. I understand it conceptually. Um, wait, she's texting me. Stand by, I know it's a cliffhanger, stand by. Oh, I'm, I'm being asked questions. How have you adjusted your schedule? Oh, okay, great. We're going to do it this way. Um, so in terms of my schedule, I, I do, for a really long time, my, um, my home studio has been where I do the bulk of my auditioning. Um, so in that respect, not as much has changed. I am, however, a person who likes to be a part of the world. I like to go out. I like to be connected to people. I feel like everything I do that inspires me is about connection and relationships and always comes back to accessing joy and empathy and love. So being able to connect with other humans in my life is a huge part of my daily routine. So while I do a lot of my auditioning work at home, um, I will leave the house and connect with humans in my life. I will go to a studio and do a job. Um, and those things are not available right now. So one thing I've done to adjust my schedule is I'm leaving a lot of room to connect with the people that I love. Um, this technology is, um, I get, I get a little emotional about it actually. Um, I'm going to get emotional right now because if we're gonna go through something so difficult and so challenging and so scary um, that forces us to isolate, which is so counterintuitive, right? We go through a crisis and, and we all wanna connect. Um, I, I think that the ability to connect with each other in this way by video um, is huge. So I've adjusted my schedule in, in that respect. And now I'm working to um, actually do a lot more jobs from home. So my home studio is turning from uh, mostly an audition spot and an occasional professional studio into what I think is going to turn into a full-blown professional studio. Um, and I see that Angelique is asking me a question. This is all new for me, guys. I have never done this in this particular way. Are there things that keep you motivated? Yeah always. Um, so for me, accessing joy and light and laughter are huge. 
not just because I want to be a sparkly person and always happy. This is, this is a really, really tough time. Um, but I stay motivated again by connecting and by allowing myself to find those moments of joy in terms of motivating creatively. Um, I'm fortunate in that the microphone, for whatever reason, has turned into a mindfulness practice for me. Um, I have a really, really active brain. It is extremely difficult for me to quiet my brain. Um, but so that kind of meditation is sometimes difficult for me. But even if I'm feeling anxious or even if I'm feeling down in a day, once I get myself to the microphone, I feel transformed. I feel transported. So it's actually finding ways to approximate the usual ways I get motivated. So I guess that's kind of what I mean about staying connected to people in this like video chat form, whether it's FaceTime or Skype or Zoom. Um, those things motivate me. Those things make me excited. Um, and I think we have to have a balance. If we, if we sink too deeply into... Uh, fear and isolation and concern, um, I think we'll lose sight of why we want to thrive. So I stay motivated intentionally and actually as a survival skill. My phone buzzed. Let's see if it's our friend. It's our friend. By the way, I think it's adorable that I'm trying to read this without my glasses. Hang on. What does joy look like to you? That's a great question. I love you, Angelique. Um, it's funny. It's such a great question. Jo I'll tell you what joy feels like to me. Uh, um, it feels like I can, I can feel my heart being lighter. Um, and it's a physical sensation. And what joy looks like to me um, is... I think laughter, I think love, and I think for me, being able to connect, whether it's through entertainment or even just um, with an idea, with something I'm reading, I guess it's just a feeling of being alive. You know, joy is so hard to define, that feeling of happiness. I have a necklace that I love that's the molecular structure of serotonin. I, I like to think that, that um, you know, if an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, catches the serotonin in the synaptic gap, right, between neurons, and it just kind of hangs it there for a little bit longer, um, that if we concentrate on it and we linger just a little bit longer in our moments of light, that, that we can feel it more. Um, so I think for me, that's part of accessing joy. I also, light is associated with joy for me. Um, I always have like sparkles on. It, it seems odd to talk about that in the midst of everything else, but there are plenty of shadows. So for me, the feeling of joy is accessed through, I guess, this metaphor and sometimes the reality of light. Pardon me. I have an important call. How has being a mom shifted? Wait, is that right? Um, I think it says with school during social distancing. I'm pretty sure that's what that says. Okay. Yeah. Right. School, social distancing. Angelique, let me know if I read it wrong. Um, well... <laughs> I happen to like my kid a lot, which is wonderful. Um, I am out of the house a lot working, even though I do a lot of my um, auditioning from home. I work a lot, which is a huge blessing. Um, so in our normal experience, um, I'm going to double check that I'm hearing this right. In our normal experience, I don't spend as much time at home. Let's see. Oh, homeschooling and work. Okay. Um, so, so there is, there is, and I'm always looking for gifts, right? I'm always looking for like, okay, where's the, where's the light? Where's the thing I can, 
I can glean from this. Um, there's an opportunity to be connected with my kid, um, which I love. The balance of homeschooling is, um, it's hard. Um, I, my, my role in my house right now really is um, concentrating on the work portion. Um, you know, I do uh, additional work in, in addition, as I said, to, uh, to voiceover, um, keeping up with that work, keeping up with my voiceover work, um, making sure that my studio is up and running. Um, these things are keeping me um, up here. This is my this is my space. This is my domain in the house. Um, and uh, I'm up here quite a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky that my kid's dad, um, my husband, is, is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of homeschooling. But I do come downstairs and I can tell that there's, you know, some discord around an assignment or, um, you know, the interpretation of how to handle something. And I, I want to step in. <gasps> I can see you. I see you. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. I am so sorry. I Hi. literally got locked out of my own stream for 10 minutes, but life is great. Oh, Here we it's go. It's so nice to see you. I Good. missed you so much. I missed you. This was this was different for me. You were doing, <laughs> doing a great job <laughs> at reading text messages and answering questions. <laughs> oh, in social distancing and digital media, anything can happen. Um, but you were saying about homeschooling and shifts and how much you love your kid, which is I love like my kid. It's a real he he actually is is a wonderful motivator for a lot of things for me. Um and his um his spirit uh I would say is a lot like our spirit, yours and mine. Yeah. Um, so pardon me, I'm, I have to talk about my kid for a second. So do it because so your kid loves dad jokes as much as I do. So do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is, this is more when my, my kid, he's, he's nine, but when he was five, I just want you to get a sense of this child and why I say he's a great reminder of joy. When he was five years old he was playing with something and, and I, he said, ah, oh, that's impossible. And I very magnanimously, right. was like, Oh, sweetheart, nothing's impossible. Like what the, right. So, I mean, cause I want him to learn that nothing. And he looked at me and he said, that's not true, mommy. Something's impossible for love to end. You can put your hand up to stop it, but love will move right through. Five years old. That's my kid. I mean, I'm not knowing you. This isn't very surprising. I mean, I I, I learn from his <sighs> empathy too, right? And he's also, I mean, he's he's a nine year old boy. He also wants to play Roblox all day. So I mean, you know, it's a normal household. It's not just like you know, ethereal, you know rainbow unicorn like I mean it is but I mean it's um, not a home for it's not a home for fairies what I'm confused well I I don't have the camera trained on it right now but there there are quite a few fairy figures in my uh in my little office up here um but but yeah the homeschooling thing I will say is challenging partially because um well frankly partially because I'm I'm a, a bit of a control freak doesn't do it um I I pour myself into everything I do. And it's very hard for me, just being honest about it. Why else would we be talking? Um, it's hard for me that I can't do everything right now. I want to be downstairs helping him with his work. I want to be um, participating more than I can be, but I need to be doing the work from home that I do and that I can do for my family. Um, so I feel pulled. And I can tell if I like come downstairs between sessions and I, you know, grab something from the kitchen, you know, and I can tell that there's something I could have helped with, something I could do. Um, but I think that's also part of the collaboration that we need to do right now, right? Mm. Everything we do right now is about being part of the community of the world, right? Even staying home, staying isolated is the most connecting thing we can do. And it's so bizarre. It's so bizarre. 
in crisis, in trauma, what we want to do is connect with people. What we want to do, what we need to do is push away isolation. If someone's depressed, we tell them, increase your support system. Be around those people. Hug them. We can't do that right now. But the most connected thing we can do for our community is what we're doing. And so part of that for me means letting go of doing everything at once and doing my part and staying home, working, giving up a little control. <laughs> it's a Just struggle. A little, but a little. It's a struggle, right? Because we've, we've been talking a lot over the last week and a half about giving ourselves permission, taking a step back, putting the phone down. Like folks have these things that they're they're retraining their brains. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm gonna butcher it, is like, be brave enough to be bad at something, right? Mm -hmm. It's this, this idea of right. we do have this innate desire to want to be around people. You know, you are our first West Coaster on the show. Like, how? What is? How is LA? Like, what's the feel? Like, how? How are things going right now? It's it's interesting. I think um, for the most part, everyone I know has been hunkered down for a while, um, and you know, even before the rules became more stringent, um, we were we were all sort of preparing you know, to the point where, of course, shelves were bare and um, those concerns, you know, came up. Um, I think, at least in my entertainment world community, um, there's a, a balance, right? There's a blend. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are worried um, and there are those who are pouring themselves into their work because it's the thing that makes them feel the most, going back to the word normal, right? Um, I would say, you know, I went, I went to the grocery store last week. I stocked up for three weeks. Um, there is a picture of me looking ridiculous. I look like a gnome that is trying to rob a bank. Pictures I, or it never happens. I'll, I'll text, I'll text <laughs> you. Like, I mean, like a mask that I already had a mask because of uh, construction and stuff. So a mask, but then um, I like how I have to explain so you don't think I'm taking them away from hospitals. Like this is where we are, right? I mean, um, PPE is like a real thing right now. And it's it specifically is. an issue in major cities, uh, and specifically in New York right now. And so I, I do I do would acknowledge, like, a, like thank you for acknowledging the fact that Folks are really struggling with PPE. You know, my yeah. sister works in the healthcare in, in industry and she is essential. And, you know, that is something that is a major concern uh, in larger cities at yeah. this moment. So, so I wouldn't want to to take away from anything anybody needs, especially in the healthcare world, because those are those are the people who are there, not only on the front lines in terms of their own exposure, but but also being able to to help the rest of us. So again, it, you have to be future focused, um, which I'm sure we'll get back to. But my um, my uh, bandit burglar gnome outfit was a mask, and then a very bright orange bandana, but like with Paisley, like full on robbing a bank when you're six years old playing in the backyard. I'd expect nothing less. Yeah, me too. And like, you know, hoodie, tied up, gloves, you know, and like my little glasses. I, I looked like a gnome robbing a bank. But, you know, it was, again, a collaborative experience. Everyone is standing six feet apart and nodding and smiling at each other. And of course, this won't surprise you. So I've got my, this is a glasses cleaner. So I've got my thing on, but I realized no, no one can see my mouth. So I kept turning to the people next to me going, you can't see me, but I'm smiling at you. I'm smiling at you. Hi, I'm, I'm smiling. You can't tell. Because that I, <laughs> that's who you are. And I love it because you know what? People needed that. That's how I feel. When I was in the store, I was at Trader Joe's. Um, I also went to every single person I saw um, who worked there and said, thank you so much for working right now. Um, and each one of them used the same word, which I found striking. Each person said, thank you for acknowledging. 
the word acknowledging came up. I must have said it to five people, all five people. Thank you for acknowledging. And there was something about that that I, I was struck by because we do need to acknowledge the people who are putting themselves out there and the grocery store workers are a huge part of that. Um, so that is part of how it's going in Los Angeles, I would say. Um, you know, I, the streets are quiet. Um, I've taken some walk jogs around the neighborhood and even that, you know, whoever sort of is on the sidewalk first might move to the street for the other person and just wave. We're very, um, I'm noticing that there is a lot of um, give and take when it comes to the space, the personal space. I haven't encountered anything that seems um, angry, aggro. Um, I, I have friends who are very concerned. I have other moms who are talking to me about, you know, what do we do if one of us gets sick? And that's a hard conversation. That's a really hard conversation. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's also uh, extremely interesting just because everybody's experience is different, but I, I do love the fact, and I think we should, we should all be taking that moment to acknowledge um, and to acknowledge a little bit of, of personal privilege at times yeah. uh, about being able to stay at home. Yeah. Uh, it is, it is a, definitely a, a different situation um, than a lot of us had ever anticipated. And it kind of goes back to what you're saying, this idea of we are used to being doers. Mm -hmm. Like both of us are doers. Like oh, yeah. if something is wrong, we want to do, we want to fix it, yeah. we want to be there. Um, oh, and I don't want to forget, if you are watching right now and you have a question for Julie, please type it in the chat box or in the comments and oh, it will pop up. Type, or play the piano. This is a, this is a, yes, this is more like playing the piano. <laughs> this is typing. Yeah, typing. Uh, so please type it uh, in the comments uh, or the chat. Uh, now we'll ask your question live uh, because another part of this is acknowledging that folks you know, need a connection. And this is this is a digital connection that folks are, are trying to be out there. And and one of the things I love is that you do never shy away from digital connection. Like you are always on Twitter. You are a sparkle goddess of replies. You are a bastion of dad jokes uh, <laughs> and good puns, which makes me uber happy. Because um, you do have to find those little, and that's why I ask like, where do you find joy? Because these little pieces of joy Mm -hmm. uh, in it, and and while mm -hmm. acknowledging this is a very serious situation, this is a situation that unfortunately a number of people in this country um, won't. You know, we have lost a mm -hmm. number of people in this country, uh, and we have lost a number of people in the entertainment industry. And so, I don't want to not acknowledge that mm -hmm. how serious this is, but also how serious how it is to stay home. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, Jeebs Beebs, uh, Jeebs, you can let me know if I said that correctly. For me personally, I'm much happier in isolation and social distancing is a dream come true. <laughs> oh man, I'm so happy for you. Well, I mean, I think there's something, again, there's something really positive to be found in that, right? And, yeah. and I think, you know, for those who are feeling grateful for the opportunity to be home, grateful for the opportunity perhaps to to maybe avoid some of the social discomfort. Um, you know, I, everything you just said is so, so deeply important to me, right? We have to acknowledge the pain and the difficulty and the struggle and the fear and the grief. Um, and uh, I may be, um, I may be known as a sparkle person and a lot of rainbow unicorn stuff, but, um, but that, that is a response to a balance that is necessary. I am hyper aware with all of my empathy as a deep empath um, of how hard this time is and how easy it is to feel um, almost like there's a responsibility to be miserable all the time, right? If you're an empath, mm -hmm. there's a responsibility sometimes some of us feel. And I think that that for those like like yourself who um, are our caller, um, who might really appreciate the experience of like almost normalizing social distancing, I think it's okay to allow that to be positive. 
Yeah. It doesn't have to mean that you're grateful that people are sick. I, I think it's important to be able to own the empathy and the caring and the concern and the preparedness that we have to have to be present in this yeah. in this experience and also go, okay, well, what what gifts are there? How can I how can I make this something that again makes me thrive? So if you thrive being alone, then then take that space. Yeah. What a what a what a great way to find again the light that casts the shadow. Right? That's why I talk about yeah. light. Like there's always the light casts the shadow. Um, yeah. and I, I think that balance is crucial for all of us. It's the same thing as, as looking at the balance. Sorry that I'm rambling. Um, uh, okay, great. That's permission. I'll keep going. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, um, I think, I think the balance of, of present and future, right. Um, mm -hmm. I always talk about anxiety as a time machine. I have a, um, I have a background in psychology, which I don't know if you're aware of. So I look at anxiety as a time machine. So anxiety wants to take you into the past to worry about everything that's already happened. And it wants to take you to the future to have you predicting and being terrified of the things that could happen, right? So anxiety is always taking you somewhere else. Right now, we are forced to be completely present, but at the same time, our preparedness necessitates this awareness of the future, which can bring up an anxious experience. So we can't be completely future focused. We can't be completely in the negative, horrible projections because then we will, again, we'll sink. But if we ignore them, we won't be prepared. And we can't completely, like I said, present because then you're not preparing for the future, but you have to be present enough to see, okay, Right now, I can, I'll talk about myself. I, I'm healthy right now. Right now, I'm okay. Right? Okay, here are the things I have around me. Here's what I'm grateful for. So that doesn't spin me out into everything's falling apart. That hasn't happened yet right here to me. Is it happening to others? Yes. Is it activating my empathy? Oh, God, yes. Is it making me cry? Yeah, all the time. But I'm also making sure that I'm holding on to gratitude at the same time that I'm holding on to future focused time machine, anxiety producing preparedness based on every single thing that I read and I read all of it. But I love that though. And I think, and I'm glad you mentioned that you have a background in psychology because I think that also goes into how you're able to put yourself into every role you've ever played. Yeah. Like it, do it doesn't ever surprise me. Um, but also how you're able to, um, how you're able to and empathize is, is a word, but also relate yeah. and, and be relatable to what's happening now. Um, I know we had a question and I, I wanted to make sure I asked it because we've got so many great fans, but I think it's also very connected to this idea of psychology, this idea of projecting and pulling back and putting yourself in the spaces, mm -hmm. you know, how do you in, in that kind of route, and also you can say this even through the perspective of not being able to, to go outside and not being able to do what you normally would do to prepare for a role or audition for a role or like put yourself in that headspace. Mm -hmm. How are you adjusting um, mm -hmm. based upon how you would normally prep for an audition or a role or as you're looking at scripts and getting ready to, you know, Play an anthropomorphic character, you know, be a rainbow, um, <laughs> play an assassin. I don't know. I'm a pencil. Uh, How are you? Oh, look, it's a pencil. I didn't know I was a pencil. I can see myself in the camera like that. Um, yes. Cool. Have you ever played a pencil? Because now I'm very curious. Because you no, did a very good job there. Creative quarantine, guys. You heard it here. We are going to create a show based on a talking pencil. You and me, right now. This is it. It's gonna happen, right? The Done. pencil talks. It tells. It tells the person what to write, and then, and it has to be voiced, and it comes true, <gasps> and then, then there's magic. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> to answer the question, um, uh, I'm I'm much more interested in giving you the authentic answer than than anything more floral than this. Um, my process has not changed a bit. Um, I, I don't do on camera. The only on camera work that I do is, um, motion capture, performance capture, um, which is really fun. But, uh, but I don't, I don't 
do the kind of performance work that would require me necessarily to leave the comfort of my home. So my process every time I get an audition is I dive into whatever information I can glean. I my my process is it's a three step process. It makes me feel very nerdy, but I have a three th three step process, and it is <laughs> um, knowledge, empathy, and then the voice print. Um, so my belief is that the more research I do, the more grounded I will be in understanding the character, understanding the world of the character. So I am the jerk who will pick apart your scrubbed sides that are supposed to make a person not know what the franchise is. I'm like, cool, that's good. Yeah, you just said plant life. And then I heard something about New York and a commissioner. Great, this is DC. Hang on, that's poison ivy. Like I, but like that, and that was by by the way, terrible imitation because I will go deep dive into stuff. Um, so whatever I can glean, even if it's a scrubbed side, um, and then if there's nothing I can find, if it's not um, an existing IP, um, I will research the text that I have. I will figure out if it's a game. I will research the developer. Right. So if I get an audition from Square Enix, um, I am researching the last five. I mean, the Square, I know their stuff, but like, you know, I, I look at cutscenes from the last three games they've done. I look at the heart and the aesthetic. Um, and so all the knowledge I can I can gain from doing my nerdy research grounds me. Then I go to empathy um, and I'm trying to find a way to empathize with the character. Um, I've played some pretty dark characters. I've played some really like sinister villains um i always have to find a way even as a sparkle person um to empathize right where did that come from why is this person angry why is this person looking to exact revenge on someone um and feel for and believe that person's perspective um and then once those things happen i always say the voice print just falls out of my face <laughs> so i don't choose the voice first i feel like the voice is chosen almost like in this spiritual way <laughs> i love it it's very no fancy. i think i, I think, that, I think that's but i think that's really it's thank you one for sharing and i think that's i think that's really it's a really interesting and a, good, a really good tip for folks who are thinking about doing what you what you do um oh we have a question how exciting oh, it's a very exciting question because it's about food uh <gasps> yes because a, a yeah. secret, we both love food. Um, hi, Julie, what's your comfort food right now? Movies, tea, food, media. Like what is, oh, I guess. Oh, food, media. Oh, I was gonna go for like, okay, it's white cheddar cheese popcorn. Um, so far I've been able to stay current with my avocado supply. I am aware of how West Coast that makes me sound. I did grow up on the East Coast. Please give me a little leeway here, but avocados are amazing. Um, uh, so yes, I would say between white cheddar cheese popcorn and avocados, um, those are my comfort foods. I that's I don't know what to tell you, but that's I not respect really that. Way. Thank yeah. you. I, I think um, I think we were. Yeah. I even missed that one. Clearly, I need to yeah. go get a snack. <laughs> food media. It's food media. So uh, I would say um, <laughs> I'm not doing a ton of it. Um, I just started watching Schitt's Creek because I had never seen it and a couple of friends badgered me until I did and I'm very glad I did. Um, and oddly, um, my comfort media right now is Cosmos. <laughs> I'm watching the Cosmos, which is incredible. So I'm looking at the history of our universe. Um, that comforts me. <laughs> I think I'm too much of a nerd that. for this question. <laughs> No, I think you're the absolute right amount of nerd for this entire show. This yeah. is fine. It's Cosmos. Fine. Yeah, I'm kind of. I, I I'm love kind of that. Doing it's a lot of Cosmos for me right now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, is there anything else uh, that you're like you're kind of consuming right now, um, media wise, books, games, like yeah. uh, any artists, any artists that you're supporting? Um, that's interesting. A lot of local artists that I'm supporting just in my neighborhood. I've um, called up my favorite small businesses and um, asked them if I can, um, you know, buy a gift certificate for myself or for someone else, or can I just donate or contribute? So I've done that where I can. Um, and some of those are, are 
local artists of sorts. Um, and in terms of what I'm I'm consuming, I'm I'm usually listening to one audiobook while I'm reading a physical paper book. Um, right now, I am in the middle of an unwanted book. Um, mm. I think I'm, I just finished Islands of Fire, and I'm trying to think. I think I'm about to start another one. I have like three seconds left on that one. Um, but I've been reading, and of course, you know, why not add a little dystopia to our dystopia? But um, I, I have been um, trying to break a story, and I've, I've been working on this for a long time um, uh, in that genre. So I tend to consume as much as possible um, the the media that matches that genre. So there's sort of a fantasy and unwanted is kind of like a um, Hunger Games meets Harry Potter world. Um, and I have found it really inspiring. So I'm, I've been focusing on those things. Um, let's see what other media. I had read Wanderers last year, which is a phenomenal book by Chuck Wendig, who has become a buddy of mine through social media. Um, and um, and in life, I actually met him in person, so I can tell you were buds. Um, but his book is uh, un unfortunately prescient in terms of what we're experiencing now. So I highly recommend the book. And still, it's there's a lot that's connected to our current world. Um, but I, uh, I definitely appreciated it. And he has um, a wonderful book on writing called Damn Fine Story, um, which I've just picked up again. Um, and it's fantastic. And if you like Chuck's um, if you like his voice on social media, the way he um, tweets, the way he talks to people, the way he offers advice and just his general humor, the whole book is really laced with that. So it feels like he's talking to you more than it does sort of a dogmatic or didactic textbook about writing. It's really just more like, hey guys, what we're doing, which I really like. Love it. Well, we got one more question okay. and then we're going to close up for the day. Uh, hi, Julie. Your voice acting career CV seems very DC Marvel Comics sci-fi heavy. Was this your choice to go that way or is this just where the work was? That's interesting. You're kind of a nerd. So it's a 50-50 <laughs> shot of what this answer is. <laughs> um, I am an equal opportunity nerd. Um, so I, I would not say that I had a hand in what jobs I've gotten other than um, perhaps an idea that I've been highly inspired by those pieces of copy when they come in. So maybe there's something about the way I approach them. Maybe they spark something in me that um, that matches you know what they're looking for. Um, but I do I do think I to me one of the reasons why I gravitated toward voice acting, um, well, I've, and it's not for this conversation, but I, fe I really fell into it um, because of an insult. And I was like, ooh, that looks like fun. Let's do the thing that I was just insulted for. Um, uh, someone said uh, when I was doing on camera that I had basically a cartoon voice. Um, but I, I stayed in voiceover because it, it, it offers this incredible spectrum of a playground. And I like the fact that I can play a little baby, a little tiny person. And also, I can play an old lady who's perhaps a caricature, but maybe this is what? What happened? Um, and you would never really cast me as those things, right? If you were visually looking at me. And I appreciate that. So, so I guess my answer is I don't think I would um, ever look at something, a character, and be like, mm, this doesn't match the aesthetic that I want. Um, I really get excited to play a broad range of characters, but you're right. That is kind of interesting that there's a, a sci-fi Marvel DC kind of feeling. And um, I've never thought of it that way. Maybe there's something about what I put into those auditions that makes those the jobs that I book. So thank you for your question. I am now going to ponder. Apparently I ponder with my nose. We were supposed to do this. I'm like, is, that, is, that your, I'm like, is that your ponder face? It's more like, Boop. I don't know. I just boop, booped my own nose. That's what we've we've come to this, guys. Okay. I'm booping my own nose. Great. I mean, you know, a <laughs> couple weeks in the house and you're booping your own nose. This is where we're at. I hope that's not uh, a bumper sticker. <laughs> I hope that it becomes a bumper sticker. That's what I hope. Um, thank you so much. This was absolutely incredible. Uh, for those who are watching right now, where can they find you on the interwebs? On the interwebs, I uh, have the same handle for um, Twitter and Instagram. It is Julie 
underscore Nathanson. Uh, I am trying to get better at Instagram. I, I'm told that I'm doing better, but I am so much more about words than pictures. So I do get into Twitter mm. and um, I should probably end on this. You asked me what motivates me and what where I can find joy. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that my brain let me remember this moment. Um, Sometimes I put out on Twitter and sometimes Instagram motivational or light oriented, inspiring things that I think of, even if it's just, you know, kindness effing matters. Or, you know, if you have a little extra light today, share it with someone else. And doing that motivates me. Sometimes I do it because I'm already inspired, I'm already feeling connected and kind and compassionate. Other times I'm doing it because I need it. And there is something very beautiful about giving what you want to receive. So I'm not necessarily doing that so people will say, oh, you're so nice. It's not that. I, that's not it. It's knowing that somehow somebody might have been moved by that. Someone else's dark day might have been lightened. And then that reflects back in my heart. And it makes me happy. And I feel like like I've made a difference in some small way. So from our homes, isolated, in the middle of this crisis, right? If we reach out to one person, if we can get one person to feel cared for, to feel like they matter, then, then we matter more. And so that is how I stay motivated. It's offering kindness and compassion and love and empathy and checking in on the people I care about. And yeah, responding to people on Twitter and writing things that might make someone smile or laugh or think. <sighs> there's no other way to have ended this this is absolutely amazing thank you so much julie guys stay tuned for tomorrow uh we have sports journalist ld granderson our second la person who is going to be joining us uh to talk about sports and how sports is faring in all of this which will be an interesting conversation uh but this is julie you oh no i adore you thank you for inviting me i'm really honored you have an incredible array of guests and just you doing this, I think, is an emblem of the collaboration we're all working to do right now and to be involved in. So thank you for what you're doing to bring us all together.